You want to learn to price this way? You want to learn to price based on value? You need to learn to have conversations about value. You need to improve your conversational skills. You need to get out of the presentation business. I'm fond of saying you can present to somebody or you can be present to them. You can't do both. You've got to pick one. Hey, Feasters. Welcome to episode six of season five of Live in the Feast. I'm Jason, aka Rez, helping you improve your business by having a conversation with someone who's been there and had success so that they can build the business designed around the life that they want to live. That's Live in the Feast. This episode, I'll admit, was a great joy for me and great honor because I was able to have a conversation with someone who's been my virtual mentor of sorts since the very beginning of my career as a business owner. Blair ends. Blair said something during this conversation that I think is really important. And as he talks about his defining moment and where he lives physically today, pay close attention to what he says about the noise of big cities and big environments where your clients may be or may actually reside in. But the reasons he shares on why it's not the ideal space for him, it's a great context for positioning yourself as a professional, as the expert in your field. In this episode, we dive into why creative professionals, developers, designers are terrible at pricing, how to master the value conversation and the four step framework that you can use today, what the goal of value based pricing is to you and your clients. I'm really excited about this one. You'll want to listen all the way through to the end of this. And then before your next sales call, come back to this for a quick refresher so that you can master the conversation, close more deals, and land those higher budget clients. This episode is brought to you by Feast, the premium online coaching and community designed for developers, designers, marketers, and freelancers like you wanting to specialize their business and build recurring revenue that is both profitable and sustainable. Today's market is ever-changing, and yesterday's advice won't cut it. Feast members get exclusive access to the roadmap and training library, which includes everything you need to niche down, build recurring revenue, and become that go-to expert for your services. That, together with the monthly roundup calls, exclusive workshops, expert chit-chat, and our Slack community, you'll have everything you need to build a business around the life of your dreams. If you're serious about not competing on price and having those clients that respect you and your expertise, then join Feast today. Head over to feastcourse.com. If you use the code pricing at checkout, you'll receive 15% off the annual membership price. Feasters, season five is all about selling your service, and I'm super excited today to have on the show Blair Enns. Welcome, Blair. Hi, Jason. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, thanks for being here. Blair is the founder and CEO of Win Without Pitching, the sales training organization for creative professionals and author of two books, The Win Without Pitching Manifesto, which I love, and Pricing Creativity, a guide to profit beyond the billable hour. And from a personal perspective, Blair is a virtual mentor of mine. And between the manifesto, his blog, and one particular blog post called, now you, I think you changed the title to The Polite Battle for Control, he helped me shape what my business is today. So I'm honored to have you here on the show, Blair. Can you share us why you do what you do? Oh, why? Hold on a second here. Why I do what I do? I so I've written. I've written about. I feel like I've written about everything. I've written an article on this. It's called <laughs> um, "There Is a Woman." I see her clearly. So I imagine we do sales training for creative professionals, and um, <clears throat> and even though I'm in the sales training business, and previous to this was a sales consultant, I don't consider myself an expert in selling. I th- I feel like I'm more an an expert in 
uh, the peculiarities of the creative personality that makes selling difficult for them. Hmm. So I always imagine that um, there's a woman and sometimes it's a man, but I just imagine one person who's a creator of some kind of designer, a videographer, whatever, some sort of creative professional who, who sees that, that creation as their calling. They see it as their calling. Maybe they see it as their gift. It's why they're on this earth and they choose to make the brave decision to make their calling their enterprise. So they start a business around this skill that they have of creating in some form. And most of these people, as they start these small businesses, they're really driven by the craft of what they do. And, you know, they haven't really fully signed up for all the business parts that go with that craft. Mm -hmm. And one very important part of the business part of the business is selling. So I always imagine this creator standing in front of a prospective client and she's nervous and vulnerable because she doesn't really understand how to sell. She has this idea that it's a little bit sleazy or it's about self-promotional. So she, she doesn't have a good understanding of it, doesn't have a confidence in her ability to do it. But her her success is predicated based on this. So I our business is built around helping that person in that vulnerable moment. And if this is all I ever get to do for the rest of my life, that will be enough because that's a pretty compelling thing to me. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. I mean, that's, <laughs> I mean, you kept saying she or her or something in there, but that was me back in 2012. I broke out on my own in early 2000s for the first time. And after two years, I had to go back and get another job. But I always knew that I was going to work for myself. And then 2010, I left my agency job and started down the road again, basically learned all these other things, sales and marketing and how to do that kind of stuff, at least what I thought and how to do it. Then in 2012, I hit another wall and I was just like, I had just recently proposed to my then fiance, now wife. But a month later, I hit a wall and I told her that I was going to have to go back and look for a full-time job. And so she was just, she looked at me and she said, well, that's not what you want to do. And I know that. And I know that that's not what you want for us too. So, you know, we'll figure it out. And <laughs> she's like the rock. Well, you should marry that woman. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. Right. And so I was like, wait a second, if she's backing me and supporting me in this way, then I have to figure this out. And that's how it was for me. I was like, how do I, how do I do this? And I was a generalist web developer doing everything underneath the sun. I literally sat down at night for four to five hours every single night trying to dissect my business at that point in time to try to figure out what I was doing wrong and what I was doing right and those kind of things. And how I came across that blog post specifically was because I searched for how to control a sales conversation because I wasn't good at it. I felt timid. I felt anxious. I felt that I was not a salesperson and didn't know how to do that. And that particular blog post for me resonated so well because that was my personality. Like <laughs> the reason why I wasn't a good employee was because I had too many opinions. <laughs> I said, if you want me to do the job that I was hired for, you have to allow me to do that. And when you said essentially those words in one of the paragraphs of that, I was like, oh, so I'm not crazy. <laughs> it was like this validation. It was this light bulb moment, so to speak, in my, in my journey there. So why you do what you do? Well, here's proof right here. If you don't already have so, which I'm sure you do being you know, a couple of decades doing this at this point, you know, that for me is my, your why is right here. So I appreciate that. Well, thanks for sharing your story. I want to talk about the books. I mean, you wrote the manifesto and First of all, the books are two very different books, right? The one's a manifesto. The one kind of resembles to me anyway, the like those <laughs> car manuals that you saw in like the 80s and <laughs> 70s, right? Like those big binders that was on my father's and grandfather's workbenches and things like that. But so why did you structure the books in, in those sort of ways? First, the manifesto, which is kind of like an easier read, but then, then, then the reference manual, so to speak. Yeah. So the manifesto is the, um, it's the yes, you can book. It's a, it's, it's supposed to be an inspirational book. Um, I think uh, people do find it inspirational. It's sold over well over 20,000 copies now and going strong and sales just keep picking up eight years later, sales just keep going up and up. 
so that was that was meant to be a timeless book that put forward my philosophy and I wanted people to be able to read it fairly quickly. You can read it in two, two and a half hours. I wanted them to put it down and think, okay, there's a different way to do this. I don't have to always kind of prostate myself to the client and, and give up the expert practitioner in the relationship. I can push back. I can hold my head high. I can stand my ground. I can do all of these things in the sale that set up the conditions for me to be able to do my best work in the engagement. So it was really a yes, you can book. And an early reviewer of it said, that book's book makes me feel like I could wrestle a bear. And I love that line. It's like, I want people to like slam the book down at the end and go off and wrestle a bear or feel like they could wrestle a bear. No, please don't wrestle a bear. (laughs) And then um, seven years later, so in January of 2018, I published Pricing Creativity, A Guide to Profit Beyond the Billable Hour. And that's really a here's how to book. And it's a here's how to book on the subject of pricing, not so much on selling, although I do bring that kind of sales point of view or perspective to selling, which I think is one of the novel things about the book. But I did publish it in a, in a manual form. And somebody said to me recently, it looks like a pharmaceutical sales manual. And the irony is that <laughs> it was designed by the same designer, the two books. Oh, are the okay. same. And the second edition of the pricing book is going to be, the design is going to be different when I get to it. There's a whole bunch of things that aren't in the first edition that not, a, I don't want to encourage people not to buy it if they haven't bought it. And it's going to be at least a year before the second edition comes out. But I know now there's some things that I'd, I've learned since the book has been published that I'd like to include and I will and we'll change the design at that point. But I do like that it's in a manual because I wanted it to be, even though you can get the electronic version and you can get a video version of it, I really wrote this as a what I hoped would be a readable reference manual. I wanted you to read it once through And then I wanted it to go on a shelf pretty close to wherever it is you sit. And every time you have an opportunity to scope and price a proposal, I I hoped that you would pull that manual off the shelf, re-familiarize yourself with some of the rules. There are six rules I have in the book. And then maybe review some of the appropriate tips in the tips section. And then flip to the last section, which is the tool section, just using some simple checklists and templates to help you craft that proposal. So I really did envision this as a manual. In fact, I had a, I won't name his name because I don't think it would be fair to him, but it's a very famous, famous worldwide marketer who's written a lot of best-selling books. And he agreed to read the advan- an advanced copy of the book and maybe write a blurb for me. And as he was reading it, he was giving me this very enthusiastic feedback. And then in the middle of reading it, he said, okay, here's what I think you should do. Like, And he basically said, demanualize it, strip out the footnotes, strip out the references to economic theory, make it simpler, et cetera, and make it more kind of a classic readable book and less of a reference manual. And I thanked him for his input and told him why I wasn't going to do that. <laughs> And he was great. It was a great conversation. And he was very fully respectful and supportive of my of my position. It's just it wasn't the way it wasn't the book that he writes. Um, Mm -hmm. And I probably won't write another book like this, but I really did want to write a usable reference manual that was enjoyable and enlightening to read. Mm. Before we get into that, because I have a question specifically on how you frame that and package that book. I like to ask, what what's your defining moment in life so far? Oh, man, it really depends. Like my answer would depend on what whatever day you asked me, I think. But I would probably say, well, I'll certainly say today, and it'd probably be the most common answer, would be my decision to leave the world of advertising. I'd worked in advertising and design. I was actually working for a design firm at the time. To leave the city... And to move my young family to a remote mountain village in the middle of nowhere on the shore of a 90 mile long lake set between two mountain ranges in British Columbia, a short nine hour drive from Vancouver. And that's where I'm speaking to you from now. And I've been here. And so I started the business. That move precipitated the launch of Win Without Pitching which was initially a consulting practice. And since 2013, it's been a training company. But where I live gives me really valuable perspective. First of all, my quality of life, like living in a small town, it's just so beautiful. Uh. I mean, it's physically beautiful here. The people are wonderful. I love living in a small town. I have four kids. It's my youngest child's 17th birthday today. So I've raised four kids. Oh, wow. Happy birthday. Yeah. I've raised, my wife and I have raised four kids in this little village. 
We love it. And I, I, it's hard to imagine. I don't know who I would be if I didn't live here just as a person and also as a professional, because I always say, so I do a lot of work with ad agencies, like large agencies and then <clears throat> small design firms right down to freelancers and people who listen to your podcast. And I always love visiting the cities. I was in London seven times last year and I always joke about going to New York. I can't stay in New York for longer <laughs> than three days because when I go to Madison Avenue, and it's not really Madison Avenue anymore, but the epicenter of the advertising world, when I go there, when I'm there too long, I start to believe what they say. I start to believe <laughs> that my theories don't work in reality. When I know they worked in reality, I've proven it, proven it across right. hundreds of firms, thousands of firms now. But I start to hear what some of these uh, who are at the epicenter of it all, everybody's got this tunnel vision. They're kind of blinded by the conventions and if I, if I, if I were, if I were mired in that noise, I wouldn't be able to think the thoughts that I think, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to cement the beliefs that I've cemented. Mm, reduce the distractions. Yeah. I have friends who are, you know, competitors who have been friend who have become friends in the cities of New York and London and Sydney, other big markets. And, um, Everybody kind of nods at, well, along at my theory, the one without pitching theory, but it's like deep down, I know they think it's a nice theory, but it doesn't really, you can't really make it work. I know they believe that. And one of the reasons they, even though they won't say that to me, even though they, <laughs> I know they believe it because they're just surrounded by all of the noise. When you get too close to it, you can't, it's really hard when you're stuck in the middle of a system to have perspective on the system itself. Mm. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. That, that makes sense. I mean, I live in New York. I lived in the city for 10 years. Now I live with my wife and son and newborn on the way here on Long Island, but it's definitely quieter. It's, you know, we have a backyard that I can go into those kind of things. And it's nice to get away. It's nice to like not be in that rat race once in a while. Yeah. So like, it's, I, I totally it's nice to that. be able to go into it, but be able to remove yourself from it so that you can have perspective on it. Mm, excellent point. So the pricing creativity manual, the book. Now, the idea of a book, basically, when somebody says, hey, I wrote this book, there's that expectation of what that is based around how it looks, how it's priced, the value of it. The manual that you wrote, the package, so to speak, that it is, was that intentional to say, okay, look, because it's not a $20 book, right? It's There's definitely different tiers. As you mentioned, you could get the electronic version or you could get the, the hardback version, those kind of things. And was that an intentional strategy? Yeah. And let's just cl clarify, let's put some numbers to this. So there's three different packages you can buy or formats of the book. And the most expensive one is $320 where you get the manual, the ebook and the videos, the accompanying videos. The ebook itself is just $100, $100. And that not just $100. That's not a lot of money, but for given what it is, but it's a lot of money for a book. And the mm -hmm. middle option is um, the ebook and the manual for $199. So it's one hundred, two hundred, or three hundred dollars approximately for a book, and some people, most people, look at it and go, "Okay, well, there's." First of all, all all of the options are guaranteed. So if you buy it and you don't get value out of it, just you know, we'll send you your money back. Send us the book back. We'll send you your money back. No questions asked. So most people are pretty comfortable with it. But every once in a while, I get people just laboring over that. Can't I cannot bring myself to spend a hundred dollars on a book? And those people, if they send an email, and it, it's happened five or six times out of the couple thousand copies that we've sold so far, five or six times pe people email me just kind of like, oh, I can't, like, it's just, they're asking all these questions <laughs> about what they're going to get. And it's fully guaranteed, right? So just buy it if you don't. <laughs> so I just, I, first I say, well, it's fully guaranteed. Just buy it. And if, you know, if, you, if there isn't value in it, then let me know. I'll send you your money back. And they still come back with all these questions. And, and then I say, listen, you should not buy this book. <laughs> because there are some people in the world who are so focused on expense and it's known as price buyers, right? They just want the lowest mm -hmm. possible price. They're so focused on and the expense that they don't think in terms of value or ROI. So it's like those, if that's like, those aren't good customers for us. You can't, right. it's hard to have a value conversation with a prospective client 
if you yourself don't think in terms of value. Now, my guess would be most of us don't think appropriately enough in terms of value, but you can learn to do that. And if you heard that sentence and thought, yeah, okay, yeah, that's me. Like I would, I would like to be able to learn to do that. Then you, you'd probably be a good candidate for this book. But if you just, if you're still hearing and ringing in your ears from the prices that we've been talking about for this book, then I can't help you anyway. So right. don't spend the money on this pricing book or any <laughs> other pricing book. Yeah. It is fun. You know, I sell selling and one of our core values at Win Without Pitching is do what we say or lead by example. So when we sell selling, we do all of the things in the sale when we're selling training services that we advocate to our clients to do. Not mm -hmm. absolutely everything because some things don't translate to a productized service business like ours, but almost everything does. <clears throat> so it's our we understand that we have a responsibility to sell the way we would want our clients to sell. And as I was writing the pricing book, I thought, well, this this principle of do what we say, you know, I should probably price the pricing book this way. So I think it's I think it's the only pricing book in the world that is priced based on the principles in the book. Mm. I might be wrong about it, but I haven't found another one. Yeah. I mean, and I've read plenty of books, but I know I haven't read every single one, but I would probably agree with you. I mean, even just in the midst of this conversation, you price anchored to the high, right? Like yes. the high, high to you, right? <laughs> First, right? So you're still practicing what you preach. And, and, you know, listeners out there, what Blair talks about a lot of times is, is when you, and I'm going to paraphrase it and probably butcher it, but basically what you talk about is, is price anchoring to the high point of the options that you're presenting to your clients because that's the home run. That's the grand slam. This is what we can do for you. This is where, you know, everything that you could ever dream of to get to where you want to, this is what we can do for you. And then you give them, you dial it back a, couple, a few notches, right? And that's essentially what you did just here. You, when you gave your prices, you, you went to high, low to medium, right? I mean, for me, hearing in the context of the conversation, the things that I've read and heard you say time and time again, I'm like, yep, there's, there's one, there's one, there's one. Right? Yeah. If I would have done it perfectly textbook, I, I would have, here's what I should have said before I even talked about the price of the book. I should have said to you, Jason, when I was writing this book, I got to I asked myself, like, how much value do you think you can create here, Blair? I've come up with a number. I'm pretty sure that through this book, I can add a hundred million dollars a year of net new profit to the readers of this of this book, and I can do I do the math. I, I I have a sense of how many books I can sell based on my audience size, and we're definitely on track for it. And I have a sense of working with clients of what kind of return people will get. So I've I've got some conservative numbers on both, and I come up with yeah, I think this book will generate. $100 million annually of net new profit to the readers of this book. So, mm -hmm. and I mean, that's a, when I did the math, that's a staggering number and we're on track. Right. We're on track to do that. If my numbers are right, I mean, sales wise, we're on track to do that. And then, so I asked myself, well, okay, if I'm, if I'm creating a hundred million dollars a year in value, what should my, what should my share be? How much should I earn from this book? So I arrived at the number. It's, um, I set a goal. My goal is to earn a million dollars from this book. And I'm, I'm on track to do that. Now, if I start and I sometimes do a talk and I say, <clears throat> I say a friend of mine, I told him I was writing this book and he made the comment that, no, well, yeah, yeah, I hope you make a little bit of money. Of course, nobody writes a book to make money. And I said, I intend to earn a million dollars from this book. And his jaw dropped. And so <laughs> I tell this story from a stage and I say to people, it's my goal to earn a million dollars from this book. And then I pause. And then I say, okay, I want you to tell me what your honest, immediate emotional reaction was. What was your reaction? And then, especially in a design community, people will go like, you're greedy. That's unfair. You're a monster. <laughs> I felt like getting up and walking out, things like this. And then I do the math on value and I say, okay, I arrived at that number because I'm pretty sure I can cre help to create $100 million a year in net new value, net new profit to the readers of this book. So if I were a consultant, and you were CEO of a large company. And I came into you and I came into your office and said, you know, I'm pretty confident I can increase your bottom line by a hundred million dollars a year. And my consulting fee is just a million dollars. You would take that all day long, wouldn't you? Yep. So that's fair compensation for a consultant. 
why is shouldn't it be fair compensation for an author? I like it. Yeah. I read Alan Weiss's book, Million Dollar Consulting, years ago, and I was reading that book, and there was a one sentence in the book that caused me to change the trajectory of my business. And I put the book down, I closed it, and I contemplated that that's sentence for a while. And I thought, okay, I'm making some changes to my business based on this sentence. And then for years, I thought, what was the value of that sentence? And I thought, well, if I'd paid a consultant to come in and and give me that advice, would I would have paid him $20,000 for it, but I paid $20 for the book. So when I wrote my right. first book, which has been out of print forever, it was called the Win Without Pitching Guidebook. It was a three ring manual of everything I knew I dumped into it. I sold it for $1,000 a copy, $995 a copy. And it was only available on my website as is pricing creativity now. And I didn't sell, sell a lot of them, but at the time it was kind of meaningful revenue to me. And I essentially tested that theory. I thought I would have paid $20,000 for the advice that was in a book. I am not going to be bound by the package of the advice. So my first right. book was at $1,000. And I've since learned that, you know, as long as you're providing value and if you're backing it up with a guarantee, it really doesn't matter what the price is, as long as there's a significant return for the buyer. And if you're putting in a guarantee, if the number seems outrageous, then it really does not matter what the price is. Mm, yeah. I mean, and and bottom line, $300 when you are freelancer or you're an agency, $300 investment in your business, chances are people have paid thousands of dollars for courses or so on and so forth. The $300 price to me, you're going to get a return on that on your next project by far, if not more than you would, and you know, what you're accounting for, right? I don't know. To me, that's where the value, that's how I look at value is what's the ROI that I'm going to get. And, and you mentioned it there too, is which I want to touch upon here is, is why is it so hard for creative entrepreneurs, freelancers, designers, developers to sell value-based services? Yeah, it's a good question. And there's a where there's all kinds of components to the answer, but there's a couple of main ones. The And really the biggest one is that we are not very good at conversations. So if you want to sell value, you have to learn to master the value conversation. That's rule number five of the six rules in the book. And it's the hardest thing to do. It's the longest chapter of the book. It's the one where I spent the most time on that chapter. And it's also the one where it doesn't matter how many times you read it, you are not going to learn this from reading it in a book. So of all the training I've been doing in the last year when I'm traveling the world doing speeches and workshops, in those one-day workshops, I spend half of that day just workshopping, having the value conversation. And a value conversation, the framework is pretty simple. It's four steps. It's uncover what the client wants, uncover the metrics of success. What are the things we'll measure to prove that you've achieved what you want? Uncover the value that might be created by helping the client get what she wants. And then setting some pricing guidance. If I could help you create this value, would you pay me X or between Y and X, starting with the high number first? And that's the simple framework. And you can, I've just given it to you. You can go ahead and use it. But it's really hard to learn to get good at it for a couple of reasons. The big one is you have to learn in the moment of having a value conversation, you really only master it when you can let go of the solution. So that means you go into the conversation not presupposing anything about what the client's problems are or what the solution might be or what the cost of the solution might be. You, you have to use that framework. You have to bring that framework to the table without any kind of baggage about what the engagement might look like. So that's the first step. And everybody finds that difficult. And, and the more of an expert that you are in what you do, if you're a subject matter expert, one of your one of your the benefits of being a subject matter expert is you see patterns. Mm -hmm. You go into this value conversation, your focus should be on the client and the value that she wants to create. And when you start to see patterns, you need to let go of them because you you don't want to think about scoping and pricing until after the value conversation. So that's a universal, but com coming back to your question, that difficulty is universal, learning to let go of the solution while you conduct a value conversation. That's why it's hard for most people. But coming back to your question about why is it particularly hard for creative people, 
I said to you that creative people aren't very good at conversations. And you, if you think about it in the typical creative world, so you've got a client, uh, you have a prospective client who recognizes that they have a problem or an opportunity. So they talk amongst themselves and they they identify some firms they want to reach out to and they get a bid from and they put together a little brief and then they lob the this brief in the form of a RFP. They lob it to a bunch of firms and those firms are kept at arm's length and they're told that you know, we can't have a deep conversation with you. So they talk amongst themselves, they lob the RFP over to the firm. And then the firm, if there's multiple people in the firm, they have conversations amongst themselves and they come up with a response and then they lob it back. And then the client Mm -hmm. reviews all the responses and they talk amongst themselves and they say, well, these ones are pretty good. Let's invite them to the next stage. So they lob the next invite over to the selected firms and they're told, okay, to prepare some stuff that you're going to present to us and here are the conditions for the presentation. And then the folks on the agency side, they prepare their presentation. Then they go into the room and they present and the client sits there with their arms crossed and, and they don't say much. And at the end of the presentation, the client says, thanks, this is great. We'll get back to you. Then you leave, the agency leaves and the client talks amongst themselves. And then they say, okay, let's choose this one. They They lob something else, a new brief over to the selected firm and say, here's the real brief. So in the way we sell in the creative professions, all the communication is one way at a time. Everything is built around the presentation. There is very little real two-way collaborative, open, transparent conversation. And people listening to this are probably thinking, yeah, I kind of get it, but it's a bit look, it's a bit of a generalization. It's kind of true. But I'm telling you, as somebody who's who's workshopped this for years, creative people are horrible at conversations with clients. They go into presentation mode. They they start to transmit and they quit receiving. And if you've been in this business long enough, if you've been a creative professional long enough, you start to think that this is just the way it is or just the way it should be. But then you go watch somebody else who breaks down, who does something else for a living, who just has like conversations in the sale. That's the way it should be. So we're not used to, you want to learn to price this way? You want to learn to price based on value? You need to learn to have conversations about value. You need to improve your conversational skills. You need to get out of the presentation business. I'm fond of saying you can present to somebody or you can be present to them. You can't do both. You've got to pick one. Mm, yeah, I like that. Yeah. I mean, I try to go into every conversation with a prospective client with curiosity. I want to, yes. you know, as a web developer, right? Like as a web developer, yes, I could talk code. I could talk tech. I could talk all these things, but what problem do I solve of yours and how important is it? And, you know, what does success look like versus failure? You know, these kind of questions I ask all the time. And, and I've been doing this for a decade full time. And even when I first started doing these kind of exercises, I mean, the looks I would get from across the table or over Skype or something like that would be like, who are we talking to here? Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> are you a developer? <laughs> like, what? What? <laughs> so that's how I approached it was in my mantra has always been, I want to have somebody that's coming to my desk, leave from the conversation in a better spot, whether that's with me, whether that's with a referral or whoever, right? And in order for me to do that, I have to be curious. I have to understand what the problem is. Yeah. I heard Ron Baker, who's an author of two great books on pricing. I heard him quote Peter Drucker the other day, and I quote Drucker on a lot of things too, but it was a quote I'd never heard before. And Peter Drucker is essentially the father of management consulting. And Drucker's Mm -hmm. line was, um, lead with your ignorance, not your expertise. And others have put it the way you just put it, which is curiosity. Curiosity is the most valuable asset when it comes to consultative selling or value-based pricing. So letting go of any kind of presuppositions and just be curious. And it's this duality, right? You have to, you know, you're on one hand, you're the expert and that gives you the confidence to lead with your with your ignorance. And on the other hand, so you, you want to have this kind of beautiful blank mind of the beginner. So you have this beginner mind, expert mind, and you kind of need to hold both of those ideas in your mind at the same time and have them make sense. You're both the expert 
in the beginning, beginner. And what I like to say is there's really two, it's a generalization, but it's helpful. There's two main forms of expertise. There's subject matter expertise and process expertise. And process is Canadian for process, by the way. (laughs) So almost everybody listening to this is a subject matter expert, right? So subject matter experts, as I've already said, see patterns. And this is comes from my friend and colleague and podcast co-host, David C. Baker. They see patterns everywhere. They're like the dead people, dead people in the sixth sense. Client starts talking and you immediately think, I've seen this before. I know what your problem is. I know what the solution is. I know what we usually charge for that solution. And that's what you need to let go of. So I say, in the moment when you're having the value conversation, you just stop before the conversation begins and you let go of your subject matter expertise and you replace it with process expertise. You say, my expertise in this moment for this conversation is the facilitation of this simple four-step framework where I'm going to focus first on what it is that the client wants. Second, the metrics of success. Third, the value that might be created by helping her achieve these metrics and get what she wants. And once I have that, the fourth step is I will set some pricing guidance. I would say, if I can help you create this value, would you pay me this much, this much? Set some sort of range of pricing guidance. And then at the end of that conversation, you walk away, then you go back to your studio, to your office, hang up the phone, get off the web meeting, whatever it is. And then you start thinking about solutions and costs. So it starts with value to the client first, then price, then you start thinking about solutions and costs. Yeah. And because I know that that this is probably ringing in everybody's ear at this point is, is how do you talk about price if you haven't talked about the solution? Yeah, it's actually, so it's a little mental hurdle that you'll get over fairly quickly, but it's a It's something that's obvious that comes up because you're not, the question is no longer about the solution or the service. It's about the value creation. Right on. So if I'm asking you, you you come to me and you have a problem, you state it as a problem. You state, you probably state your problem as a solution. I need to build a website or whatever it is. And then I get you to just kind of back up a little bit and tell me about what it, let's just think beyond the website and tell me like, uh, further down from their website, further down, like what is what is it that you want? What are the things that you want to be true? I'm going to even think get you to think bigger than the website. So, mm. what like what does what, what does success look like down the road for you? What does happiness look like? And you'll you'll there are ways to ask that question. I get it. We get into that in the book, but people can kind of discern it from what we're talking about here. You just get people to think bigger. Well, I call it the DFS or desired future state. Your job is to uncover their desired future state. Tell me what you want to be true in the future. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then like, what are the, how would we measure whether or not these things have come true? What are the things that we'll measure to prove that these things have come true? What's the value of all of these things coming true and of us hitting these metrics? What's uh, If I could help you create this value, what would that be worth to you? So we're not talking about the transaction, the website, et cetera. We're staying completely focused on the value that the client wants to create. And that's really the benefit of value-based pricing. And when I'm doing a speech, I'll ask people at the beginning, what, what do you think the, the goal or benefit of value-based pricing is? And everybody says, charge more. And then I say, well, that's not the right answer, but I'll I'll ask you again at the end. And then at the end, I get them to see the goal of value-based pricing is to create an organization, your your business, whether it's just your freelancer or your team, but an organization that's laser focused on extraordinary value creation for the client. So you let go of like, we sell websites or consulting or whatever it is, and you just focus on value creation for the client. Now, there's all kinds of things you have to consider when you start, when you you leave the value conversation, you start scoping, you start putting together your proposals, et cetera. But if you can master the value conversation, if you can learn to have that conversation where you're, you really are focused on what the client wants and the value that you might create for the client, then you can set kind of a theoretical price range and it doesn't have to be narrow at all. You're just looking for kind of theoretical maximum any kind of budget that the client might be bringing to the table you know just any kind of pricing information you can have you can uncover but you really are trying to get the client to think about return on value creation 
And then you get some numbers mm-hmm. and you go back, you work with those numbers to craft your, to scope and price your proposals. So right. it's a fair question, you know, how do you, how do you arrive at price without solutions? And the answer is when you learn to do this, you see that it would be ridiculous to start thinking about solutions before mm-hmm. you set pricing guidance. But again, it's the hardest thing to do. Right. Yeah. I mean, and, and you referenced patterns a few times. And for me, in my leads, I've always, and this is what I, I help other freelancers try to, that are developers, they kind of, my audience, my people try to figure out is, is in the midst of the conversation, figure out what path they're on. Right. So I often find that my leads are falling into one of three buckets, one of which is either bringing in new revenue or save time or bring in the same revenue faster. And if I could figure out where they're headed in the midst of the conversation, then I could start to figure out how, what that value is, right? So if I see that they have somebody that's hot, you know, basically cut and pasting or data entry or something like that, like, okay, well, there's a lot of overhead. There's person sitting there, there's salary, there's all this other stuff. Okay, what does this cost to you? Right. And, you know, I basically ask those types of questions and I find that the only pushback that I get is, is when people start saying, okay, but that's great because you're developing something. But if I have something that's intangible, let's say a design, and I think I know how you get to answer this, but how do you help somebody overcome that? Because they don't, they look at it almost like here's the, the digits But then there's, here's this abstract thing. And how do I present a value around this abstract thing? How can it be certain that it's going to be delivered to them? Yeah. And certainty is a tricky thing because every price that you put in front of your client essentially has an uncertainty discount built in. So it does get trickier as things become more abstract. And as, you know, if it's hard to ascribe value to something, and it's a harder to price based on value. But I have a friend who's a designer in Paris and he I talk about this story in the book and he said to me one day, I can almost, he said, I can almost retire based on my royalties. And I said, what royalties? You design posters and websites and other things. He said, yeah. I, and I, he said, I've, I have clients who, uh, where I've done the identity design for them when they were in a startup where they were a very young company and they couldn't afford my fee. So I, uh, I retained the IP and I licensed the identity to them. So I, he said, I have, I have mm-hmm. residual income from that. So that's an example of, you know, what's the value to, uh, what's the value of a logo to a startup? And I asked this in the question in the book, Nike paid $35 mm-hmm. in 1971 for the Nike swoosh. So $200 in today's <laughs> money. And then I give an example of a million dollar logo. And I say, okay, so look, what does the logo cost? The logo costs between 200 and $1 million. And it's really... The difference between the Nike startup and the Pepsi rebrand in 2018, you know, different companies, different stages, the risk level was a lot higher. Um, Pepsi easily, willingly paid a million dollars for a logo and Nike right. paid $200 for theirs. That's a difference of 5,000 times. So we need to, we really need to stop and think, you know, what's the value of this logo to this company? And sometimes that means that in whatever it is that you're doing. And sometimes when we get locked into pricing our inputs of time, then sometimes you'll be in a situation where your price is just too high. Sometimes value-based pricing means finding a way to deliver something to the client that matches their budget. And that almost means letting go of your idea of how something should be done. So we see Mm. patterns, we get an idea of, I see the pattern, I know what we would do, I know what we usually charge for what we do. And the client says, well, it's not worth it to me. And now you're in this standoff and you kind of resent the client because they're not valuing your time. And what's really happening is you're not recognizing, this isn't universally true, but it's sometimes true, that you're not recognizing that this thing that you propose to do for this client really isn't that valuable to them. Therefore, you should think of a different way to do it where you can deliver a less expensive solution and still make money at it. So one of the outcomes of value-based pricing is you become far more entrepreneurial. Every one of your engagements becomes this kind of creative exercise where they all look different. And that might be true for your listeners now, but I'll bet you what's not true, even though all the engagements are slightly different or maybe even drastically different, I'll bet you what's not true is 
the pricing, the compensation plans aren't drastically different. You're probably trying to fit everybody to the same comp plan. And your compensation plans should be creative exercises too. And if I looked at your client base and let's say you had 10 ongoing clients at any one time, I would hope I saw, you know, five or six or seven different compensation plans where you were getting paid for different things and on in in different ways. Maybe in some you're selling time, maybe in some you're selling the outputs or the deliverables. And maybe in, you know, half of them you're selling uh, value or outcomes. So you're getting paid based on hitting KPIs or leading indicators, like maybe a number of leads generated, or you're getting paid a percentage of sales, or maybe you're getting paid a percentage of the company when the company is sold, if you have a client who's trying to build the company for sale. So there's just so many different Mm -hmm. ways to get paid. And um, they should all be, when you craft those compensation plans, they should all be creative exercises. Mm, Yeah, I think that's a a great way to wrap it up. I know uh, we're pressed on time, but before I let you go, what's next? What I, You said that you're going to write version two of Price and Creativity. Yeah, second edition will come out sometime in mid-2020, I think. So I think it's probably mm-hmm. about 16 months away. And oh man, I've got I've got kind of competing book projects. In fact, I have two meetings this week on uh, on one of those projects. So I'm not sure... I'm writing another book and I just have to decide which one gets to go first. And I promised <laughs> myself I wouldn't talk about them until they were, because the <laughs> pricing creativity, I said it's coming out Fair. in, I think it was June of 2016. It's going to be out in June of 2016. And it came out in um, January of 2018. So I'm not going to do that to myself or my audience <laughs> again. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. For sure. We will hold you to the fire here. <laughs> so so where can folks reach out and say thanks? Uh, yeah. So I'm Blair Ends on Twitter and LinkedIn. They can find me at winwithoutpitching.com. Uh, the, mani- the Win Without Pitching Manifesto is available at Amazon. My latest book, Pricing Creativity, A Guide to Profit Beyond the Billable Hour. They can find that at pricingcreativity.com. And the uh, there's a, the audio edition, eight years later, the audio edition of the Win Without Pitching Manifesto will be out in, um, I guess it's going to be the beginning of March, probably next week. Yeah. On audible.com. Nice. Great. All right. And we'll link all of those up in the show notes for sure. Blair, thanks for your time. I appreciate it. This was a truly, truly an honor for me. And I know that the audience is going to get a ton of value out of this. I know I've jotted all down a bunch of notes myself. So thanks again for your My time. My pleasure, Jason. I've really enjoyed talking to you. And for everybody listening, until next time, it's your time to live in the feast. I don't know about you, but I've got a ton of notes from this one. I should have probably warned you at the beginning to grab a pen, but no doubt you'll want to listen to this show again before your next sales call. Next week, I'll be back with Matt Johnson, who built an agency helping businesses break into niches, build relationships, and create authority by launching a branded podcast. Until then, it's your time to live in the feast. Music.